not a lot of people know that you're kind of like me in a sense that you love to interact with the fans, especially on good plays, bad plays, and all that stuff. I, I'm very demonstrative about it. You're a little bit more low-key about it, but I know it, it riles you up when you're able to get the fans to interact with you. Talk about how crazy this year has been with, like, no fan interaction, no fans in the stands in this crazy COVID year that we're experiencing. Yeah, man, it's it's definitely different. It's, uh, it's definitely got its pluses and minuses. Uh, you know, it sucks not being able to interact and, and, you know, feed off of that energy, even if it's negative energy. I love, you know, fans booing me and, and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> they, they boo you. They boo you a lot. I'm sure. <laughs> bro, I, in Germany, especially, man, I would go play in Bonn and every time they boo me. Yeah. They yeah. hated me in Bonn. But, uh, um, yeah, it, it's definitely different, but, you know, at least with no fans, you are able to, you know, have that interaction with your teammates and be able to communicate ball screen defense, mm-hmm. be able to communicate with the coach more often, be able to hear the plays. Because, I mean, you know how it is. You play in a loud gym and may not be able to hear, you know, 10 feet away from each other. Imagine trying to call out, you know, a ball screen and stuff uh, with that kind of noise. But, uh, you know, some teams are trying this, uh, like, pumping in crowd noise and stuff, and it's, mm-hmm. it's the worst. It's Trash. not genuine. Yeah, it's not Trash. genuine. At all. It's, <laughs> all it does is, you know, distract you at that point because it's not like you're getting energy off of, you know, the speaker. So. Right. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, I was not loved in Germany either by opposing fan. <laughs> that you know how I play, yeah, running exactly. into ball screens and falling and all that stuff. So yeah. the fans didn't really love me in Germany either. But the fans at home absolutely loved me doing Gieson. Yeah. So yeah. what a time to be like. Oh, but I mean, I don't know if I should mention this now or later, but just remember that you're you're zero and two in your pro career against me. So <laughs> man, that was. <laughs> That was a rough year. Did I play against you my second year too? When, uh, you went back in to- Bremerhaven. Yeah, I went back and I think, yeah, you were with my boy Johnny, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There it is. Yeah. So 0 yeah. 3 maybe, because I don't remember losing to you when you were in Bremerhaven. So, hey, all right. I'll, yeah. I'll take an extra dub. <laughs> Bro, those are some rough years to start for. Yeah. Man. Rough yeah. team. But hey, look at where you are at now. So, you know, like yeah, it's yeah. it's not an easy path. And I think people like kind of forget about that. Like it's not ever an easy path, no matter where you go play. I remember mm-hmm. like some of our former teammates even were asking me like, hey, like, are you your league yet? I'm just like, bro, you know how hard it is to make it to that yeah. level. So it's like, you well, just got to keep your head down league, and keep grinding. Yeah. Speaking of your league, we just lost our point guard to uh, Cheska. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Big, big hit to our team, but we picked up your guy, uh, Skyler. Now. Skyler. Shout yeah. out Skyler Bolin. Hell yeah. yeah. The, the whole Geeson team, and I'm still close to a lot of those guys, so it was just such a good time yeah. for me. Yeah. I want to go back to your senior year. Uh, like I mentioned at the top of the show, like you're up by far your best year, averaging 11 points, uh, six rebounds a game. Talk about maybe the vindication that you felt like, finally, I'm healthy. Uh, I think Maurice Watson was your point guard that year. And obviously, he was such a good distributor of the ball. He really made you look uh, good as well. So talk about like five years of frustration, injuries, wanting to perform, not being able to do it to the best of your ability. You're finally getting better and you finally get to show out at least for one year to those Creighton fans who maybe had a bit of doubt about, you know, the kind of player that you were. And then you left them kind of wishing that they had a little bit more of Jeffrey. So talk to me about that last year and, and how what it meant to you. Man, I'll never forget uh, going into my fourth year before my senior year. or not going into it. About halfway through, uh, Steve Lutz called me into his office. And, you know, I don't know if he was bluffing or not, but it definitely worked. He uh, uh, basically told me, like, hey, if you don't pick it up, you know, you're not coming back next year. And, you know, he could have easily been bluffing, but uh, right around then I started to turn things around, started, you know, feeling healthy for the first time, feeling, you know, feeling good. I had, you know, four or five games in a row where I was scoring, you know, 14, 16, 18, you know, uh, some really good, really good stretch for me. So I finished out that year really well, which felt, you know, amazing. And then going into my senior year, feeling healthy, uh, 
uh, finally, you know, you know, having the opportunity to showcase myself and maybe uh, prove to people that have, you know, doubted me through the years that, you know, I can actually do something. And it was, uh, you know, amazing feeling to finally, you know, finally get on the court and show what I can do. That uh, junior year for you, not the best year at all. Uh, yeah. You guys didn't play too well, but like you said, it yeah. gave you a chance to really get on the floor and really be featured in the offense. That next year, senior year, you don't make it quite to the end of the tournament, but you do make it to the NIT. Talk about that run. You know, it, it's a post tournament. It's a highly talented tournament as well. Talk about that run and, you know, how it felt for you to end off your career uh, representing Korean in the NIT. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a great feeling. I'll, I'll never forget getting selected for the NIT because, you know, not everyone's that excited. But for me, it meant nothing their opportunity to play another game and you know how it is as a senior you know it's a very emotional time you're just trying to hold yeah, on for dear life like yeah. i don't want to let this go like i'm not ready for this to be over and thank yeah. god i redshirted at the beginning or i wouldn't have even gotten that year um but yeah it was such a surreal feeling to be able to play you know a few more games uh didn't end the way we wanted to losing to byu but it was a good run You've, like we mentioned before, have had such a good career so far. Obviously, we're all wishing you the best and we wish that it continues for you. Talk about, you know, the different places that you've played at. Like, I can only imagine what Kazakhstan looks yeah. like. Uh, and actually, you and Justin Carter both played on that team in Estonia, right? Yeah. Talk about, like, the different places that you've played at and maybe tell us uh, your favorite place to play so far. Yeah, man. So... I played in uh, Germany for two seasons, uh, which was honestly my favorite place to live. You know how it is. They take care Your of you. dope. Yeah. Yeah. Your money's on time. The basketball is good. I mean, great place. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I played uh, in the league that I'm in now. I went to Kazakhstan, played in the Russian VTB, and uh, that was definitely the most interesting experience. The <laughs> president was a dictator and it was <laughs> they were you know spying it was crazy it was crazy yeah. crazy experience uh but astana the city is actually much much nicer than than you'd expect it's not like what you see in borat or anything like that it's, <laughs> it's, it's nice it's nice it's like a it's like a little las vegas the buildings are big the lights are on it's, yeah it's, it's cool it's dope. Uh, the food is good Mm -hmm. uh, and cheap too, really cheap to live there. So you live like a king for no money. I mean, it was, right. it was nice. And then uh, from there, I went to France. Had a really, you know, really shitty experience with basketball, but uh, which kind of left a sour taste in my mouth about France. I mean, France is a great country. I love going to Paris. I love visiting. You know, uh, we went to Champagne, visited Switzerland while we were there. Um, yeah, uh, it was a great experience, but I'll probably never go back just because basketball is such a sour <laughs> taste in my mouth. Man. And then now, isn't it such a crazy? Isn't it such a crazy thing how like different countries have these different styles of play, and yeah. depending on who you are, like how you like to play, like it could either suit you or it could definitely not suit you at all. Like I would imagine for you, you would going into that year in France, you're just like, man, I'm in a big time country playing a high level basketball. I'll be able to really showcase my skills here. You get there and you realize the style of play is not conducive yeah. to how you'd like to play. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, I had this deal, same deal that I have now in Poland mm -hmm. and to play in the VTB, all this stuff. And then I had the France deal last year and my agent was telling me and my agent was telling me, that, hey, you know, France really isn't the type of basketball for you, but the money was better. And I was living yeah. in France instead of Poland. So I was like, ah, right. whatever. I, I can play, like, I'll figure it out, you know. Uh, and it was a mistake. But I learned a lot from that mistake. Learned, you know, mm -hmm. it's more important to choose a situation than necessarily money or even the country that you're going to live in. Uh, you know, I, I had just spent a year in Kazakhstan. I was like, man, I don't want to experience another year playing in, playing in Russia. You know, it's cold. Like, I didn't want to experience that again. Uh, but this year's, you know, 
treated me so well. It was a big mistake going to France last year. And uh, this coach here is phenomenal. Zan Tavik, uh, he's played in the NBA for about eight years. Big guy, gives the ball in the post a lot. Uh, and it's been great for me. There's really three ways to represent your country. Uh, one of them is through government. The other one is through war and obviously through sports. You had a chance to do the latter in, at the Pan American Games, um, representing Team USA. That team was comprised of, you know, a bunch of Big East uh, athletes, coached by uh, Coach Cooley at Providence, which, you know, I have yeah. tremendous respect for. I know that you do yeah. as well. He's one of Coach Max, maybe best friends in the coaching ranks in the NCAA. So talk about that experience for you to put USA, you know, at the front of your jersey to be able to represent your friends and family back home. What did that experience mean to you? And obviously you guys won bronze, so it wasn't, you know, the worst trip in the world. Uh, so just talk to me about that experience. First of all, shout out to that coaching staff and shout out to Greg McDermott for suggesting me for the team. Uh, Kevin Willard was also on the coaching staff. Uh, it was a phenomenal experience in playing for them. Uh, but as far as, you know, playing for Team USA, like that's something that I'll never forget, you know, I, I'll never forget, you know, being up there, even though we got bronze, uh, here in the national anthem play, you know, something I'll, I'll never forget. And you know, who knows, in, in 20 years, I might tell my kids that I was playing with LeBron. <laughs> <you know? laughs> 50 years more, my you, kids are going to think I was, I was an all-star in the NBA. Yeah. Know? You're you're an Olympian, all of that, all of yeah, that. Yeah, you're on the yeah. redeem team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, you could tell oh, them man. that you were the one who replaced Demarcus Cousins on the on the redeem team or whatever. Some nonsense yeah. like that. <laughs> instead of instead of in the, in the... <laughs> uh, but yeah, like I said, that bronze medal game. 18 points, 10 rebounds, obviously ending that tournament on about as high as you can. Yeah. Uh, so you step up on the podium, you receive that bronze medal. What's the feeling that's going through your head at that particular moment? Man, it was it was surreal. Even though it was a Pan Am Games and wasn't necessarily the Olympics, but but for me, it was the Olympics. For me, yeah. it, you know, meant so much. It meant, you know, my family was able to watch me. You know, I'm going to take that medal with me for the rest of my life. And uh, first of all, the game before that, we played against uh, Argentina, who's got uh, Compazzo, who's now Faku on the Denver Nuggets. Yep. Yeah. Luis Scola. I mean, that was, we got rocked by them. I mean, we had a bunch mm -hmm. of you know, young kids compared to what we were playing against. But, uh, uh, but yeah, that, that bronze medal game, it was a fantastic game for me, fantastic experience. Something I'll never forget.